we have got we have got some learned and we have got some learned and experienced cardiologists from home and abroad as panel of experts uh, professor mohammad nurul islam formerly director and professor of cardiology and icbd and ugc professor bangladesh bangabandhu sheik mujib medical university professor abdullal shafi mujumdar ex director and icbd and secretary general of bangladesh cardiac society professor dr sajal krishna banerjee professor of cardiology bsmemu also dean of medics medical Fa- medicine faculty bsmemu dr shuk near who is the consultant cardiologist chelsea and westminster hospital imperial college london he is also president of royal college royal society of medicine cardiology section communication lead british cardiovascular society dr n a m mamun jaman chief cardiac consultant united hospital dhaka he is also former president of bangladesh society of cardiovascular intervention professor fuzilatun nisa malik professor and chief consultant cardiology national heart foundation hospital and research institute dhaka professor m athahar ali professor of cardiology uh, from nicbd now working as senior consultant ever care hospital dhaka professor dr mir jamaluddin director and professor of cardiology nicbd dhaka professor dr abdul wadud choudhury professor of cardiology and head of the department dhaka medical college hospital and dr munjur shaukat who is the clinical lecturer hammer smith hospital uk and faculty of medicine may i request dr amiruz jaman khan associate professor of cardiology sir solimulla medical college to welcome our speakers guests and their attendees dr amiruz jaman khan please thank you very much dear renowned speakers from home and abroad panelists participants one welcome to you all good evening ladies and gentlemen on behalf of cardiology department sir salimullah medical college and midport hospital it is my great pleasure and proud privilege to welcome you to the international symposium on heart failure organized by cardiology department sir salimullah medical college and midport hospital thank you each thank you to each and every one of you for being here with us today through this webinar during the hard days of covid-19 pandemic from which the whole world is now suffering we are very pleased to be able to welcome those of you that have been with us for a long time now as well as those who are new to the group it is high time that such an event took place to highlight the remarkable contribution of number of researches on heart failure which take place in different hospitals and research institutes around the world a number of distinguished cardiologists have joined our faculty here and will take part in this symposium from england and india we hope this venture will provide wide scope to share our experiences and research findings on different chronic cases of heart failure in home and abroad we hope that you will enjoy the conference that will interaction with the colleagues from many different countries will stimulate a creative exchange of ideas and will be personally rewarding now i invite you to join the scientific session of this symposium and request dr mohammadullah firoz to conduct the session thank you very much thank you dr ramir jawan khan we are in fact going through this covid-19 pandemic uh, some of the countries world in the world like uk has taken good control of this covid-19 but countries like bangladesh india we are still struggling and hopefully will overcome within short period our respect to all the 
healthcare workers who have su suffered and are suffering from this COVID-19 and lost their lives in this pandemic. Ladies and gentlemen, heart failure is a global health problem. At the moment, at least 26 million people are suffering from the heart failure. We don't know exactly the data regarding Bangladesh, but at least 1% of our total population is suffering from heart failure, which amounts that more than 10 lakh, that means 1 million adult people are suffering from a heart failure in Bangladesh at the moment. There are also some differences regarding the demography of heart failure between the Western population and Bangladeshi population. Usually Bangladeshi heart failure patients suffer their diseases at least 10 years earlier than the Western population. In a hospital-based study, we have seen that around 50% of the heart failure patients hospitalized are less than 60 years of age. The main reason of their heart failure is ISD in 66% cases. In 16% cases, it is valvular heart disease, and in 8% cases, it is hypertension. This heart failure is important for us because it is reducing the lifespan of the patient. It is reducing the quality acquired life year of the patients. It has got also a great socioeconomic impact on our population also because we have to count the cost of diagnosis and treatment of the heart failure, cost of work, our loss of our patients, loss of our care. More importantly, any of the heart before they attain the ability to spend and treat their patients. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the second session with heart failure from Sarsalimula Medical College. In the first webinar session, Dr. Abdul Qadir talked about left heart failure, its clinical feature diagnosis and management. Today, we'll talk about other aspects of heart failure. Professor Abdul Qadir who is working as the head of the department, and Professor Fadlozi, Sarsalimula Medical College and Milford Hospital. You will be talking on right heart failure, dark side. May I request Professor Dr. Thank you, Professor Mimadullah Firozi. Uh, first of all, I express my gratitude to all the speakers and honorable <laughs> panelists uh, for attending this program. So today, so far my knowledge goes the randomized trials large-scale trials on right heart failure are lacking, and most guidelines did not focus on right heart failure and its management. So today, I will talk on chronic right heart failure, a dark zone. Right heart failure is the clinical syndrome of signs and symptoms due to RV dilatation and dysfunction. In introduction, we can see the 21 million adults worldwide are living with heart failure. The overall world cost of the heart failure management is nearly 108 billion US dollar. And heart failure is the number one cause of hospitalization in patients over 65 years of age. And the vast majority of the heart failure patient has got three or more comorbid conditions. And 50% of the heart failure patient die within five years from the diagnosis. So if we look at the incidence and prevalence in the whole globe, we can found that the incidence is highest in China and prevalence is highest in Malaysia and the lowest prevalence and incidence in India. And the author of that article commented that the very low incidence and prevalence in India may be under estimation of the heart failure in India. So if we look at the pathophysiology, the normal right ventricular function is governed by the systemic venous return, pulmonary artery load, pericardial compliance, and contractility of the right ventricular free wall and interventricular septum. Generating RV output requires only one-sixth of the energy expenditure of the left ventricle. And right ventricular coronary perfusion occurs both in systole and diastole that is different from the left ventricle. And RV overload increases the risk of myocardial infect ischemia. And this diagram the shows the RV systolic function is highly sensitive that minor changes in afterload increases the large change in the stroke volume. 
but that is not in left ventricle because left ventricle can tolerate the change of afterload better than the right ventricle. So an imbalance occurs in three key neurohumoral systems in the pathogenesis. One is the sympathetic system, rash system, and peptide systems. They initially place the beneficial role to overcome the heart failure by compensating the heart failure. But later on, this compensatory mechanism may be detrimental. In that situation, controlling sympathetic function by the beta blocker, rash by the ACE inhibitor, and peptide metabolism modification can play a good role to protect the heart from the heart failure. So causes, if we look at the causes of the right heart failure, some increase decreases the contractilities like right ventricular cardiomyopathy, right vent arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy or right ventricular infarction. Some increases the RV volume overload, including the pulmonary regurgitation, TGA, tricuspid regurgitation. And some increases the RV pressure overload like pericardial disease, chronic, uh, and left-sided heart failure, pulmonary stenosis, etc. And some overlaps like left heart disease increases the right ventricular overload as well as the right ventricular pressure overload, which happens also in single ventricle as well. And in Epstein anomaly, that decreases the RV contractility and increases the <coughs> So classification of the pulmonary hypertension is very important to understand the dysfunction and failure of the right ventricle. And pulmonary hypertension category basically divided into two. One is the pre-capillary, another is the post-capillary. And pulmonary mean artery pressure is more than 25 is required to make the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension. So by PCW makes the difference, the pre-capillary and post-capillary issues. In pre-capillary, the PCW is equal to or less than 15 millimeter mercury. And post capillary, PCW is more than 25 millimeter mercury. Important is the clinical grouping or WSO class. In clinic, clinical grouping, group are divided into five groups. Number one, group one is due to the intrinsic vascular disease of the pulmonary system. Group two, secondary to the left heart disease. Group three is due to the pulmonary parenchymal disease like COPD and other causes. And group four are the thromboembolic diseases that produces pulmonary hypertension. And miscellaneous is the group five. Staging of the heart failure is done by the ACCAASA. Stage A, that means no fissure of heart failure, no structural heart disease. But in stage D, stage B, there are structural heart disease without evidence of heart failure. And stage C is the symptomatic heart failure associated with underlying structural heart disease. And stage D is the advanced structural heart disease and marked symptom of heart failure at risk despite maximum medical therapy. Again, the heart failure is also classified on the basis of systolic function. That is the heart failure with reduced dejection fraction, preserved dejection fraction, and mid-range ejection fraction that is very important in the management of late heart, left heart failure. But in right heart failure, this type of uh, classification is not present. But this type of heart failure plays role in the development of the right ventricular dysfunction and right heart failure. So the principle of the diagnosis of the heart failure includes the steps approach and all diagnostic steps are equally important to make the diagnosis. And first step is the medical diagnosis on the basis of the history, sign and symptom. After clinical diagnosis, we have to confirm by the echocardiography and natural type peptide. After confirmation, we have to assess which group of the right ventricular failures is it. Pulmonary hypertension group one, one to five. Next is the assessment of the etiology because etiological diagnosis is the key point for the direction of the management of heart failure. And then we have to go for the risk stratification and ultimately we have to work up for the targeted therapies of particular patient. So for the diagnosis of chronic right heart failure, ECG shows some changes that helps in diagnosis and important findings are the right axis deviation, RS amplitude ratio is more than one in V1, R wave is more than 0.5 millivolt in V1, and P wave amplitude is more than 2.5 in D2 and more than 1.5 in V1. And some arrhythmias may be there, especially the ary atrial arrhythmias. And echocardiography is basically is important 
and very simple diagnostic tool to make the diagnosis. So what we can find in echocardiography in a patient with right ventricular dysfunction and payload. If we look, the RV wall thickness is more than five millimeter. Inferior di venacaval diameter is more than 21 millimeter and inspiratory collapse is less than 50%. And pericardial fluid collection may be present more than five millimeter in diastole. And tricuspid regurgitation peak velocity is more than 2.8 meter per second. And tapsim is less than 27. Dilatation of the right ventricle by can be assessed by the right ventricular endastolic and left ventricular endastolic ratio is more than one. And RB basal diameter is more than 41 millimeter. These parameters, other is the right ventricular fractional area changes is less than 35%. Ventricular interdependence can be assessed by the septal shift and D-shaped LV. And systolic S velocity can be measured as well. Longitudinal strain of RB pre wall is less than 20%. And right ventricular inbox of the myocardial performance is more than 0.5. However, three dimensional echography, echocardiography gives more information about the anatomy as well as the physiological changes. Some serum markers are important in diagnosis that, that is the increased liver biochemistry. In heart failure, synthetic function of the liver is impaired, evidenced by the reduced albumin and elevated INR but transaminase may be normal or minimally elevated. Abnormal renal function and empty pro BNP helps in the diagnosis as well as the management. And RNA sequencing may help, may play a role as the RV-specific biomarker. So next investigation, important investigation is the MRI, which is the gold standard non-invasive measurement of right ventricular volume, <coughs> mass, ejection fraction, including the patient with congenital heart disease. So it can also diagnose the right ventricular dysfunction and payload and can detect the changes and intermittent interventricular septal flattening. And also it can measure the cardiac output. Other investigation in, includes the CT scan, CT PA, radionuclear imaging, hemodynamic assessment of the right ventricular function, lung function test here. The overnight oximetry is useful when sleep breathing disorder is suspected. And ventilation perfusion scan is important to find out the underlying etiology. So when we go for the treatment of heart failure, we have some objective. And first objective is to improve the prognosis by reducing the mortality. And second objective is the morbidity to relieve the symptom and sign and to improve the quality of the life. And next is the prevention, to prevent the myocardial damage and progression of the myocardial damage and to make a favorable remodeling of the myocardium and also to prevent the symptom development and fluid accumulation and re repeated hospitalization. So management of the chronic right heart failure includes the non-pharmacologic intervention, pharmacologic treatment, device therapy, surgical management and transplantation. These are the mode of treatment in chronic right heart failure. And non-pharmacologic intervention is very important and it plays role for the prevention of the deterioration of the heart failure. Among these, education of the patient is very important by explaining the nature of the disease, treatment and self-help strategies. We can prepare the patient to maintain their lifestyle in such a way that their deterioration can be prevented by their lifestyle modification. Salt restriction is one of the important parts here, the good general nutrition and weight reduction for the obesity. And salt restriction recommendation now, about 2000 milligram salt per day is recommended by the most of the guidelines, though there are some variations in one or two guidelines. And smoking should be quitted. And exercise, symptom limited, moderate aerobic exercise is recommended for all patients of heart failure. And alcohol should moderation or elimination. But in case of alcohol induced cardiomyopathy, it is the abstinence. There is no alternate option. But in case of uh, chronic heart failure, 
we have to think about the vaccination for the influenza and pneumococcal disease. And diuretics, basically, what is the role? The goal of volume management in chronic right heart failure is to maintain sufficient preload for adequate filling, relieve more RV overload, ventricular interdependence, and congestion. And diuretic remain is the mainstay of therapy to treat congestion. And intensity of the therapy depends on pathogenesis, severity of the disease, and presence of coexisting renal disease. And combination of the loop diuretics with thiazides may help to control the heart failure. And torsemide may be preferred in decompensated heart failure. In guideline, AC inhibitor ARB and beta blocker is the class one recommendation. But in right failure, what, what is in chronic right heart failure? The patient with biventricular dysfunction, the guideline directed management of the heart failure is the standard practice. But in small scale, single center studies support the use of beta blocker and beta blocker, AC inhibitor and hydralazine, though the results are inconsistent. At present, use of beta blocker AC inhibitor ARB or not recommended in patients with pulmonary hypertension unless it is associated with hypertension, coronary artery disease or left heart failure. And prospective trials are not available on the role of MR antagonist, including the spinonolactone in right heart failure caused by the pulmonary hypertension. And ARNI is a good drug in the management of the heart failure with reduced ejection fraction in NYC class two and three. It is, it is definitely beneficial. It is also beneficial to improve the right ventricular function. Right ventricular failure, it, it has got very good role in improvement of the right ventricular function. And digoxin is class 2B indication in the management of the heart failure. In a small studies, digoxin 5 to increase the cardiac output and right ventricular ejection fraction in patients with pulmonary hypertension and right ventricular dysfunction. But digoxin did not improve exercise capacity or right ventricular ejection fraction in patients with pulmonary hypertension and right ventricular dysfunction. A meta-analysis did not find any improvement in the right ventricular ejection fraction, exercise capacity, or improvement of the NYC classification. So clinical efficacy of digoxin remain unknown. The Important drug is the pulmonary vasodilator therapy that relieving for to relieve the RV afterload has led to improvement in the symptom and outcome of the patient as well in group one patient with right heart failure. Rheocity guard is used in refractory group four disease to improve the exercise capacity and. Mesitanin is another drug is under evaluation. And prostacycline analog has long-term benefit on survival and functional capacity. Parenteral prostanoids remain the first-line therapy for the patient with advanced disease. Eupoprostanol increases mortality in patients with left heart failure. And prostacycline analog are not recommended to treat group two pulmonary hypertension. Phosphodiesterase inhibitor plays role in the heart failure in right side. Sometimes it plays a role to the manage the heart failure in left side as well. And it is associated with improvement in the pulmonary vascular remodeling, improvement in the RV contractility, anti-proliferative effect, and improvement of the exercise capacity. And reduced rate of clinical deterioration in patients to group one pulmonary hypertension. So their role in isolated right heart failure or pulmonary hypertension caused by the left heart disease remain uncertain. Endothelin receptor antagonist is beneficial in group one patient that improves heart failure symptom, improves exercise capacity, improves hemodynamics and prolongs time to clinical worsening. But we have to keep in mind that this group of patient needs liver function performance routinely. So mechanical circulatory support is reserved for the patient refractory to the optimal management, optimal management, and to breeze to recovery 
and to bridge the heart or lung or heart lung transplantation. It may be used in destination therapy as well, but in case of acute heart failure, 42 to 75 percent may recover to allow the MCS device explantation. That is a good news. And mechanical circulatory support, if we look the isolated RV failure, pulmonary etiology for right heart failure and right heart failure associated to left heart failure, you will find that ECMO is the option is, is applicable in three categories of the patient. So ECMO is an important tool. Unfortunately, till date, so far knowledge goes is not available in our country. We should go for that in future. So another option of the treatment is the palliative intervention that includes the balloon atrial septostomy, surgical right to left shunt, and surgical shunt placement between the left pulmonary artery and descending aorta. So balloon atrial septostomy is used as a bridge to lung transplantation, and it is a palliative measure in refractory pulmonary hypertension, and it can be used to unload the right ventricular volume and Balloon atrial septostomy is contraindicated in severe right heart failure with right atrial pressure more than 20 millimeter mercury. And saturation is less than 90 in room air. And pulmonary vascular index is more than 4,400 times. So surgical treatment is the another treatment modalities that is reserved for the valvular involvement of the right side of the heart. And transplantation is for the advanced refractory chronic right heart failure after exclusion of all reversible causes and comorbid conditions. So transplantation should be considered in patient with pulmonary hypertension and chronic right heart failure where the right atrial pressure is more than 15 millimeter mercury and cardiac index is less than two liter. Patient with chronic right heart failure from severe pulmonary vascular disease lung or double lung transplantation may be considered. So ladies and gentlemen, so I am going to conclude my lecture with few sentences. It is now well established that right ventricular dysfunction is highly prevalent and carries the poor prognostic significance in left heart failure. So prospective studies are urgently needed to clarify the management of the underlying right heart, remodeling and dysfunction, and to find out the effective treatment that improves the morbidity and mortality. mortality. We therefore <laughs> better focus on the open neglected right heart and for the introduction of standardized in-point future, future studies, randomized trials, own right heart disease and failure to meet the knowledge gap and focus the light on future management guideline so that we can recover from the dark zone of the right heart failure. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for participation. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor Abdul Qadir Akhand, uh, for your brilliant lecture. On right heart failure. Uh, thank you. Uh, in among the hospitalized patients in Bangladesh, around 73% of the patients are male patients. Only 27% are female patients. This doesn't mean that the incidence and prevalence of heart failure is less among the women in Bangladeshi population. Brother, the women patients with heart failure are using healthcare facilities less commonly. That is the that is the reason behind this. Uh, you know very well the in Bangladesh diabetes mellitus, metabolic syndrome. These are increasing in incidence and prevalence among the young patients. So many young women are who are supposed to be protected in their reproductive life from ischemic heart disease are now suffering from early incidence of ischemic heart disease and ultimately ending up in heart failure. Besides this, 7.5% pregnancy in Bangladesh are suffering from hypertension. Uh, about 1 in 1400 live births are suffering from peripartal cardiomyopathy. In fact, among the hospitalized patients, 1.4% of the patients suffer from heart
heart failure, peripartal cardiomyopathy. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Abi Al Pusaini, who is consultant cardiology in the cardiology department of Chelsea and Westminster Hospital, London, UK, she will be talking on heart failure in women. Dr. Abi Al Pusaini, please. Thank you. Um, if you just bear with me, I'll share my slides. Yes. Dr. Abi Al Hussain is a common face in Bangladesh. She visited Bangladesh on several occasions and she's a brilliant cardiologist and speaker. Dr. Abi Al Hussain, please. Um, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, and as you mentioned, you've kindly invited me to Bangladesh on a few occasions. So uh, I'm delighted to be here virtually with colleagues and friends from Bangladesh. And I hope post COVID we all get to meet again. Um, and uh, I've been promised to visit the tea farms in Bangladesh. So I look forward to that trip hopefully soon. Um, I've been asked to talk about heart failure in, wo in women. And really, I'm an interventionist, but I, I do find um, this concept of women being very different to men is a very interesting point of, point of treatment and management in women that's kind of much uh, delayed and also missed by many physicians and I just wanted to bring this to the forum here for discussion and, and kind of tell you the story of what evidence I found when I looked into this. So hopefully what I could share with you and thank you for sharing earlier some of the epidemiology you have in Bangladesh, the overall epidemiology of what I was able to find uh, with regards to the concept of heart failure with women and men, uh, what evidence and research we hold um, and the, uh, the disparities, where is the disparity coming from? Is this biology? Is this bias? What's driving this? And how do we move forward? So I just wanted to start with a big statement, actually. So um, this is some of the UK data and some of the American data. Unfortunately, I couldn't quite find um, data in, in Bangladesh uh, easily, but you kindly had shared some data with us just before I started. But there is a striking difference in the way we manage women and men. Uh, at least estimated 8,000 women die to due unequal heart attack care in the UK. And this is a healthcare system that's tax-based that works on essentially equality and free treatment so to have that disparity is very very striking so something is missing and something has been missed and mismanaged uh, we do know that heart failure um, in currently affects over 2.5 million women and it's the leading reason for hospitalization particularly women who are over the age of 65 so this disease increases in its prevalence and it's data from the West and the developing world. So I suspect women in Bangladesh and Asia will be much younger at presentation, as you mentioned. Heart failure incidence triples for women. So post-menopause, we see this uh, tripling effect of the heart failure incidence, particularly after the age of 65 and onwards. Um, and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is very common in women and highly missed. And again, women present with symptoms but because the ejection fraction is normal or may they or they seek healthcare at a later point or their presentation is atypical to what we are used to, uh, this diagnosis is often missed. So um, we all know this, that um, the leading cause of death in the world is cardiovascular disease. In women, this is the same as well. So over the last 10 years, there has been a reshuffling of what diseases kill uh, women in particular, and where we had breast cancer and, and communicable disease being the leading cause of death um, in, in Africa and in Asia, that has certainly changed. Where now we see in cardiovascular disease being the biggest contributor of death um, in women. When we look, we look at this data in kind of in high income and middle income, unfortunately, I couldn't kind of find the equal. Um, the data for low income, but it's very similar to the middle income countries, is that we find both in male and women, there is uh, there is an increasing prevalence of uh, cardiovascular disease. What we also do see is that there is a difference in, in women between the high income and middle income, where unfortunately in the middle income and the lower income country, the prevalence of cardiovascular disease is actually rising. So certainly that suggests the risk factor profile is slightly different, or if anything, the risk factor profile isn't being managed earlier. So as a result of it, there is more prevalence of cardiovascular disease that's now being uh, seen particularly in women um, in the kind of the middle income, lower income countries. And when we look at this data, if I can show you um, graph, uh, essentially 
A, which is at the top, you can see that when you look at the yellow and the green lines, which re represent the higher middle income countries um, and, and kind of the difference between you, women, you can see that kind of gap is closing, which suggests actually the, the kind of the incidence of cardiovascular disease is rapidly catching. And you can imagine the, the middle income or the lower income countries that incidence of cardiovascular disease, which would be much higher if we were to extend that line. So certainly the epidemiology is all suggestive of there is a change in pattern where now we are seeing more patients, particularly women, are at risk of cardiovascular disease compared to the West. Um, when we will look at one of the most prevalent risk factors we see overall in all across the world uh, and kind of middle and lower income countries, that the prevalence of diabetes has increased. Um, I know I don't have an arrow here, but in South Asia, you can see more women in red have diabetes compared to men. So there is a change in percentage of the prevalence of diabetes, which could be one of the cardiovascular contributor to why we're seeing that difference. And if we look at that, when we look at patients who have got diabetes, particularly women, what we do see, so the women presented by the dark um, boxes here, we see overall they have a higher co uh, coronary mortality, myocardial infarction, and heart failure, so almost heart failure is twice as much in a woman who's diabetic than it is in men. So it suggests that even there is a disparity in the actual risk factors that we are seeing between men and women. But what does that mean? So what does it mean if I had diabetes as a female compared to a man? Well, it's, it, it, what it does suggest that actually different risk factors have different way in men for women. For example, being overweight and smoking is a higher risk factor for developing cardiovascular disease or heart disease in women than it is for men. And when we further look at this, we kind of miss this concept of traditional and non-traditional risk factors, where we know that actually over the last 10 years, we've got to learn that chronic inflammatory disease is a big risk factor for cardiovascular disease. We know that metabolic syndromes, diabetes and obesity and renal syndromes play a big risk factor in both men and women. Um, retroviral disease, for example, is also a, another risk factor. But also on top of this, what we kind of miss in the, uh, the non-traditional risk factors is the emergence risk factors is that we are seeing more women present with gestational diabetes. We are seeing more women have hypertension during pregnancy. Uh, we are also seeing an increase in uh, early menopause that's been mismanaged and misdiagnosed as well in women. And what does that overall mean when it comes to heart failure? Well, interestingly, women who have diabetes develop heart disease earlier than men are more likely to be at risk. Uh, women with um, smoking um, are more likely to develop heart disease. Um, inflammatory heart disease is an important risk factor that's often missed, but it causes valvular heart disease. And again, this can present in women causing heart failure. Hypertension is one of the leading causes of heart failure in the world, and particularly in women, which is mismanaged, but in incredibly important. It's because what we don't manage very well is after menopause, there is a change in blood pressure and kind of... Um, and ethereal function and not many women have that addressed early on as they enter to menopause so many of them are left under treated for hypertension or diabetes or metabolic syndrome when there is a change of hormones but why i do find very interesting and i don't think we're very good at it in the uk is that we are seeing many women with gestational diabetes hypertension and preeclampsia the minute the baby is born, the parameters return back to normal. There is absolutely no follow-up for these patients. And actually, a high proportion of these patients go on to have cardiovascular disease and, more importantly, heart failure. Um, and this, is, this could be something that could be addressed a lot earlier and better managed. So... Um, Apart from all of these risk factors that I've just shared with you, that could be the driver for more heart failure in women and the fact that warm women are getting heart failure and also morbidity and mortality from it. Um, arrhythmias are common in women, particularly atrial fibrillation. Again, postmenopausally, we tend to see this. There are particular conditions like stress-induced cardiomyopathy, Takotsubo. We tend to see it, though it's benign. There is an association with increased risk of heart failure. Unfortunately, women still get breast cancer and chemo and radiotherapy are big factors in, in causing heart failure in women. Um, and also the, the concept of early menopause and multiparity, which seems to be quite missed in a lot of women who unfortunately present with heart failure later on in the future. Um, I wanted to also go on from this point of risk factors is to share with you what do we know from trials so far. Uh, this was quite interesting is that we, we take to trials to kind of be our guidelines for managing 
management of women with any condition. But when overall, in all kind of trials, women are underrepresented. But particularly in heart failure, if we look at all of the heart failure trials <coughs> published and have gone on to be formed forming our guidelines and European guidelines, American guidelines, Asian guidelines, women are presented about 20 to 30% at best in these trials, which basically doesn't inform us very much about, should we treat women the same as men? Uh, should uh, Do women have different physiological parameters that are not picked up? And actually when they develop um, problems or uh, endpoints, are these driven truly by the trial data or is something else causing it? So certainly this is, uh, you know, this should be taken into account and it's something I think we need to kind of hopefully resolve in the future. Certainly this does indicate that there may be a unique pathophysiology and etiology that drives the difference in the cardiovascular physiology of patients that there is a difference in drug pharmacokinetics that we may be missing because the trials don't actually give us a huge amount of information because women are underrepresented. And to this date, I haven't found a single trial that talks about heart failure only in women. So we still don't have a study that looks only at women to see the differences in age groups of women or you know, women and different hormonal therapies with heart failure. So all of that data is still lacking. Um, I, I found the system, a systematic review very interesting, and I just wanted to share the data with you because I think this is incredibly informative. This was a, a heart failure systematic review and meta-analysis that actually looked at low and middle income countries. And interestingly, it recruited patients from Southeast Asia, including India and Bangladesh, uh, from the studies that it had, uh, it had looked at, though there was a lot of heterogeneity in, in these studies. Impressively, what I can show you is that you can see that in South, this is men and women actually, impressively, that actually the patients in Southeast Asia tend to be, to be younger than patients in America or Eastern Mediterranean. So there was, an, there was a difference in earlier mm -hmm. presentation in both men and women with heart failure that I think is very prevalent. Uh, impress, also interestingly, an under-presentation of women. So in, across all studies, uh, there was less women presented. And as I mentioned, there was a great heterogeneity seen in here um, in all the studies. Overall, the patients that were in these studies had a lower ejection fraction. You can see that the kind of the Southeast Asian had a much lower ejection fraction compared to other countries. And that's, that's a very important key factor that I think um, it, it should be further discussed later on. But anyway, let, let's talk about the data. Um, I've kind of put it in red so I, you know, we can go straight to it. And this looks at how much beta blockers were used by region. And actually something like 34% of patients were treated with beta blockers. Now this is men and women. So we're currently under treating both genders with the actual therapy that works. When we looked at age, uh, the angiotensin inhibitors, this was around 50%. So again, in both genders, it was, uh, it, should, it was much less than where it should be. Um, and when we looked at the uh, mineral corticoid treatment, it's about 32% um, in, in the Southeastern Asia. So not only are we treating men and women lower, but it's likely if we look at women only, they probably will be much less treated with the appropriate pharmacotherapy. So this difference is not just biology, it's actually there tends to be some bias in the way we are managing patients. Um, and hopefully I can share some data from Europe and the world about where we have actually seen this. So this is actually data for, um, for, that was published in the European Heart Journal. And this looked at kind of primary care setting. If I take your attention to the dashed lines, you, um, the, the kind of darker dashed lines are men and the lighter dashed lines are women. What we can see that less women are getting lipid lowering drugs in primary prevention so they need it but they get don't get it they don't get it and certainly we're kind of seeing the peaks in age are much later when we look at high blood pressure we're seeing exactly the same now so less women are treated for high blood pressure in primary setting um, compared to men so it's it, it it happens at primary prevention in even just with patients having risk factors they are not being managed appropriately uh, when we look at the sex uh, the age adjusted sex differences um, between patients and, and this is kind of looking at different parts of the world so Europe Asia um, and kind of the Middle East all the data favors men completely um, but if we break it down and look at Southeast Asia again there is much more favorable data towards men than women which suggests for all factors like high cholesterol diabetes lifestyle management obesity 
women are not being appropriately managed and certainly are not getting the treatment they should be getting. Uh, when we look at uh, patients who are diabetic, so just diabetic patients with risk factors. So again, we see the disparity between men and women. Again, men are getting better treatment uh, and kind of controlling their risk factors much better compared to women. Uh, I think women only do much better in the kind of adequate physical activity when, when this data was looked at. So moving on, these are patients who've had a cardiac event and presented to hospital. Uh, the dark lines are men, the, the kind of the light lines are women. So in terms of having had an event, uh, lipid lowering drugs are less in women. Beta blockers given to women are much less again. Blood pressure medication, it kind of almost crosses the line. But again, men tend to have earlier treatment given to them. And similarly, for any anti-thrombotic treatment, we see the similar kind of trend of less women receiving treatment compared to men using the same guidelines that should be for men and women. When we look at out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, uh, interestingly, more women actually have an initial rhythm for an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. But when we look at men and women at discharge, we see actually less women are discharged from uh, discharged from hospital, uh, and we see actually probably higher mortality in women who have had an out of hospital cardiac arrest than men, uh, assuming that they both have received the same treatment for that shockable rhythm at the same time. Uh, this this data goes back to bigger studies looking at patients who've had, um, so this is a crusade study that looked at some of the data with patients with coronary disease. And again, it showed that less women received aspirin, ACE inhibitors, or statin therapy after a cardiac event. Um, we're looking at other data from a, a Danish study, similar, similar data was seen in terms of lipid lowering drugs and antithrombotic treatment. And also all of these studies, when they looked at the medications, you know, by uh, the, the analysis was done by uh, medication, it found that there was a persistence in this gap between men and women. So this is not just biology, this actually indicates that there is a bias that we as physicians, we're just not following guidelines as we should be, or making sure that women should receive the treatment um, that, you know, they need for particular condition, particularly cardiovascular disease, which is the driver for heart failure. Um, I, I won't bore you too much on this, but overall what we what the, all of this data suggested is that the, amongst the bit where physicians were not meeting the need of the uh, of the patient, that actually patients themselves as a result of it were paying less attention to their risk factors and to seeking help when they should seek help as a result of the, the physician guided management. Um, I wanted to also bring to your attention some of the data I found on six de sex differences in advanced heart failure therapy. So this is some data that was published in circulation on a paper looking at the difference in women and men with heart failure therapy. So this is uh, patients receiving ICD therapy. Uh, and impressively, we could see that uh, more men receive uh, appropriate shock therapy uh, than women. And certainly more women receive inappropriate shock therapy than men. That we use exactly the same guidelines to implant a heart failure device in a, in a patient, in a, in a female or a male, which suggests there is a difference in physiology that actually isn't seen when, with, with the trials or certainly is something that is underestimated. Uh, when this data further explored patients with CRTD therapy, actually what, what was impressive is that women do better with the CRT therapy Therapy compared to uh, um, kind of medical therapy with the same risk factor profile as men. So there is something physiologically that is driving that difference. Um, and this is the trans, so you know, the end result of heart failure that being transplant therapy. Certainly internationally, there are less women receiving transplants. So I think in the world, the data looks at probably only 21% of women, patients who receive um, transplants are women. And it's unclear why this is, why are less women receiving transplant therapy? But certainly the data suggests that actually women do better after a transplant long term. Um, and, and that's an important factor to consider that there is something that suggests there is an importance of ensuring that these women receive this therapy and also they do much better with it. So I'm going to end by this point saying that heart failure is a very important cause of mortality and morbidity in women. And hopefully I've shown you some data to suggest that we know that women, as they get older, uh, menopause plays in and there seems to be a change in risk factor profile that's underestimated, but not managed as well. 
and results in disease developing. And obviously there is a disparity across the globe of when that happens. Heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is much more common in women and unfortunately miss, but accounts for a lot of their symptoms. Um, and overall, the kind of the you know guideline directed medical therapy uh, isn't different in the way we deliver it, but clearly there is a physiological, biology and bias way of how we are delivering this because we are seeing the disparity in, uh, in patients. So I leave you with a, with a take home message that our trials are underrepresenting women um, at the moment. And certainly we need to investigate this further and look into different mechanisms and more appropriately treat our patients, particularly women, to ensure that they are protected um, and they have the same longevity and quality of life <clears throat> as our patients. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abiy al -Hassani. Thank you very much for a brilliant presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, the, the pharmacological treatment uh, is changing the morbidity and mortality of heart failure patients over the last few decades. Still, there is difference in the pattern of pharmacological treatment among the different centers of our country, also in different countries of the world. When the heart failure patients are being treated by cardiologists or in tertiary care hospital or teaching hospitals, they are we are using more and more beta blocker. AC inhibitor, ARB, RNA, mineral, uh, MRA, all these drugs. But still, many of our physicians are depend on diuretics and dioxin for treatment of heart failure. Not only this is uh, not only because this is uh, cheap and easily available for our patients, but also due to lack of knowledge and orientation of our physicians. Recently, FDA <coughs> has approved AGLT2 inhibitors for the treatment of heart failure. Uh, for both patients who are diabetic and for patients who are normoglycemic. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Upendra Kohl, who is, doesn't need any introduction in our community, in our, among the cardiologists, was the previously was Professor of Cardiology in All India Institute of Medical Science, now working as Chairman Cardiology and Dean Academic and Research, Batra Hospital Medical and Medical Research Center, New Delhi, India. He is the joint editor of Euro Intervention. He is also course director of AICT and India Life. Professor Upendrakal will be talking on journey of HGLT2 inhibitors from prevention to treatment of heart failure. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Upendrakal. May I request Professor Upendrakal sir to deliver his lecture. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Firozi. And I must uh, at the outset uh, pay my respects and gratitude to Dr. Abdul Qadir for including me in this wonderful program. I also enjoyed the talk of Mrs. Sani uh, from London talking about the women and uh, less evidence-based medicine treatment being given to the women and that's a fact all around the world. Possibly that would be magnified in our part of the world. Let me share my slides. Are the slides visible? Yes, sir. Okay, good. So I'm going to talk about, as it has been introduced, about the journey of SGLT2 inhibitors, not only for prevention, but also treatment of heart failure. And in the treatment of heart failure, now we know that even non-diabetic patients are included. And uh, there have been large number of studies on this. And the leader was empagliflozone, which in November 2015, first time a drug for the management of diabetes, which was undergoing a, a FDA test to see whether it is safe enough for cardiovascular outcomes was seen to be not only safe, but also producing better cardiovascular outcomes. This was followed about two years later by canagliflozine, and then in 2019, dapagliflozine. All the three molecules, I'm sure, are available in Bangladesh. They're all available in India. Now, coming to the study, the DECLARE, which is 
uh, you know, a very large study. And if you see the Empire Egg outcome study had 7,000 patients, whereas Declare had uh, double the number of patients. And in EMPA, 100% of patients had atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Whereas in DECLARE, about 60% of patients had only multiple risk factors like diabetes, hypertension, and others. And only 40% patients had established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Now, this was a large study, as I already mentioned, about 17,000 patients who were randomized to either dapagliflozin or a placebo. And uh, the primary safety endpoint was the composite of cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI or non-fatal stroke. And primary efficacy endpoint was MACE and composite of hospitalization for heart failure. And it also had secondary renal endpoints like the, you know, doubling of serum creatinine, increase, uh, decrease in the EGFR and other things. Now, DECLARE had Fifth, I know multiple risk factor patients were, and also established heart failure patients. And as you can see, the age was around 64 years of age. Body mass index was on the higher side. They were all diabetics, HbA1c around 8%, EDFR <clears throat> around 85. That means it's reasonably good renal function. And multiple risk factors patients were 60%. Now, this study showed that if you take the combined endpoint of hospitalization for heart failure and cardiovascular death, they were significantly reduced by 17%, 17% lower in the patients who were on dapagliflozin. Whereas the major adverse cardiac events, although had some trend, but uh, in comparison to uh, empagliflozin, where there was a significant reduction in MACE, this was not significantly different, just a 7% reduction, which was not significant. The primary composite endpoint of the MACE, if you see, in patients who had myocardial infarction in the past, had a much more protection than if the patient did not have prior myocardial infarction, indicating that sicker patients had better benefit. And if you look at history of heart failure, whether the patient had heart failure or whether the patient had no heart failure, there was almost an equal benefit, but only about 10% uh, of patients had heart failure. Look at the heart, uh, you know, reduced ejection fraction, whether it had reduced ejection fraction and not a reduced ejection fraction, benefit was the same. Mind it, it was for prevention of heart failure. Now, if you look at Heart failure and cardiovascular death, 38% reduction. Heart failure, 36% reduction. Cardiovascular death and all-cause mortality, a 41% reduction. Benefits of dapagliflozin were seen in both primary and secondary prevention. Now, if we combine and see all the studies, you would see that established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, empagliflozin very clearly had 35% lower chances of heart failure. Canvas had 21%, 31%. Declare had only 21%. Whereas major adverse cardiac events, you would see that there was about a significant difference of about 14% here versus about 18% here, but only 10% with Declare. Multiple risk factors, there were no patients of multiple risk factors alone in EMPA, but CANVAS, DECLARE and all uh, had shown a clinical benefit. Now, what are the possible mechanisms of uh, this very beneficial effect? There are several, but if one has to sum up, number one, there is increase in the hematocrit. There is shifting to a more energy efficient fuel that is the ketone bodies replace the glucose mechanism of giving the energy and also there is reduction in the left ventricular mass. So these are the three very important mechanisms by which these work and these mechanisms have been you know known now after mechanistic studies in the large studies that was not one of the endpoints to see how it works. Now this brings us to DAPA 
heart failure study. Now, basically, the premise being, if a drug is reducing the chance of heart failure, how about if we give it in heart failure patients, will it improve the adverse outcomes of heart failure? Will it reduce heart failure hospitalization? Will it reduce mortality? Will it reduce all-cause death? That was the primary uh, aim of this. And although DEPA study has come first, EGFR more than 30 because these drugs act through the kidney and they have all stable heart failure reduced ejection fraction. That means the results are not going to be applicable to class four patients who are admitted with acute decompensated heart failure you have to stabilize them first. And over and above the evidence-based therapy consisting of diuretics, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, ARBs or ARNI, they were given dapagliflozin and also spironolactone versus a placebo. And the primary endpoint being time to first occurrence of any of the components of composite cardiovascular death or hospitalization for heart failure or an urgent heart failure visit and several uh, secondary endpoints which were a part of primary endpoint individually. Now, as you can see, 58% of the patients recruited did not have diabetes. Only 42% had diabetes. Once again, as Ms. Sani was talking about, females constituted only one quarter of the patients. Three quarters were of males. And it had all races. And if you can look at one quarter of the patients were Asians. By Asians, I mean South Asians and around uh, the countries. And uh, we participated from our center in India and participated in the study. And Asia Pacific, once again, 23%. Although Eastern Europe and Russia was the maximum percentage, about 34%. If you look at the ejection fraction, the mean ejection fraction is around 30%. And the median NT pro BNP is 1,400 and above. The stable in blood pressure, ischemic etiology in about half of them, good EGFR, and once again, prior diagnosis of diabetes only in 42%. Now, if you look at the class, 68% of the patients were class 2 and 32 class 3, no class 4. One patient with class 4, that means nothing. Ejection fraction 31%. So it's, uh, you know, stable blood pressure, stable heart rate. And if you look at the quality of life index, that was again, you know, about 68, which is, uh, you know, they had symptoms of heart failure. And these are the various quality uh, life index of six minutes walk test, New York heart association classification and anti-pro BNP as a screening test. Now, this is very important that 93% of the patients were on diuretics as they are in the world, in the real world. ACE inhibitors, ARBs on ARNI, 93 to 94% of patients. And if you look at sacubitril well in combination, that is Vimara in 11% of patients. Beta blockers, which is a must in the treatment of heart failure, 96% patients were on beta blockers, 71% patients were on aldosterone or epidenone, and 26% of the patients already had an ICD implanted to prevent sudden death because low ejection fraction is a definite indication for ICD, and CRT, that is a biventricular pacing in about 8% in both the arms. So equally distributed therapeutic modalities have been used. Now, if you look at the primary endpoint, 
of cardiovascular death, heart failure, urgent heart failure admission or a visit, you would see that there is a 26% relative risk reduction in the primary endpoint favoring dapagliflozin. And if you look at the composite of primary endpoints, you will see that uh, there is a reduction of about 30% with dapagliflozin. If you look at cardiovascular death, there is an 18% relative risk reduction in cardiovascular death, which is a very important hard endpoint. And if you look at the subgroup analysis, the benefit was equal, whether the patient is diabetic or non-diabetic. So we have a drug which can be used in heart failure irrespective of diabetes. Although the SGLT2 therapy started as an anti-diabetic agent. Whether the patient was on ACE inhibitor, ARB or ARNI, it did not make a difference. So 25% relative risk reduction in both diabetics and non-diabetics. Now, if we look at cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization, once again, a 25% relative risk reduction. Total heart failure hospitalization and cardiovascular death, 25% relative risk reduction. And this is the cardiomyopathy questionnaire of the symptoms. There is a 6% change for the benefit in the symptom score in DAPA as compared to placebo, because you know, placebos also work when symptoms are concerned. And more than five point improvement in the total symptom score, 58% of patients, more than 5% deterioration in 25 versus 33. That means there is much less deterioration in symptoms and much more improvement in the symptoms. Worsening renal function, which again is an issue when you use any drug, especially this group of agent, it happened in only 1.2% of patients versus 1.6% of patients on the SIBO hazard ratio of 71. That means about 30% better, uh, you know, sustained renal function. If you look at the hardest endpoint, that is all cause death, whether the patient is dying of cardiovascular death less often, but if he's dying of something else, it counterbalances. Here, there's a 17% relative risk reduction of all-cause mortality, which I think is a very, very gratifying feature. And if you look at the anti-proBNP, which is the objective parameter of heart failure, in placebo, there's a 101% increase, whereas in depagliflozin, there's a 196% reduction in anti-proBNP, confirming the heart failure biomarker reduction. Safety, adverse events, you would see absolutely safe. Any serious adverse event is, if at all, more common in the placebo, 42% versus 38%. <clears throat> Volume depletion, not a problem. Fractures, which have been associated with canagliflozin studies, not a problem. Major hypoglycemia, not a problem. Diabetic ketoacidosis, not a problem. And doubling of creatinine, once again, much lower. Renal adverse events, not different. Renal serious adverse events, more in placebo. And then if you look at all the beneficial effects of renal safety are pointing towards dapagliflozin. Genital infections, which is an issue with the SGLT2 inhibitors, once again, of course, these are selected patients in a randomized study where you don't take this patient. But if you take selected patients, there is no increase in the urinary tract infections or urosepsis or genital sepsis at all. If you look at patients exposed to at least one dose of the study drug, once again, you would see the genital infection is not a problem because this is considered to be a limitation of SGLT2 blockers. Gangrenes, four-year gangrenes, once again, not a problem. Major hypoglycemia, not a problem. Ketoacidosis, not a problem. Four-year gangrenes, not a problem. And whether you look at diabetics, non-diabetics, no difference. So let me summarize what we talked about 
of dapagliflozin heart failure trial. This is the first heart failure study outcome trial with an SGLT2 inhibitor investigating the treatment of heart failure in adults with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction on top of standard of care therapy. That means over and above all the good things which we know about heart failure therapies, including mineral oil receptor, you know, aldosterone and antagonists. Dapagliflozin provided a very significant and clinically meaningful reduction in the risk of worsening heart failure events and cardiovascular death when compared to placebo as well as improvement in the heart failure symptom when we add to standard therapy. The safety was very consistent and very well established safety profile of dapagliflozin and the rate of discontinuation was low. And if we can, uh, you know, compare it with contest with other studies, you know, deliver is the study which is going on for preserved ejection fraction, we don't know the results. And we know that FDA, US FDA has approved this drug for the management of heart failure. Before that, the Canadian heart failure, Canadian Cardiology Society has done it. The India, the Drug Controller of India has approved this drug on 3rd of July this year. That means about 10 days back for the management of heart failure and it is freely available anyway in our country. Thank you very much for a very patient hearing and I would welcome any questions because I have other you know, meeting in 10 minutes time. So any questions most welcome. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Professor Upendrapal. Uh, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are going through this uh, COVID pandemic and Sir uh, Upendrapal, sir, are you living within yes, 10 minutes? Yes, yes, I am. I am. I'm with you. Yes. Uh, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, sure. Sure, sir. Uh, during this COVID pandemic, among the uh, anti-diabetic agents, uh, two drugs has been uh, to be taken with caution. One is metformin for fear of lactic acidosis in severe pneumonia, and another is ampagliflozin uh, uh, SGLT2 uh, inhibitors. What do you think of that? Well, SGLT2 blockers because they can produce. Uh, volume depletion yeah. in a high potency patient, it could be a problem. But right now, there is a large study going on on COVID patients with cardiac involvement in which dapagliflozin is being tried. And uh, we'll know the benefits of it. Uh, maybe it benefits, but we don't have any data in these particular patients. And we know that DPP-4 inhibitors are safe in yeah. the patients of uh, diabetes, who get into this unfortunate uh, issue of uh, COVID. Insulin, of course, is the drug of choice in all the hospitalized patients, in all the patients on ventilators, in all the patients on, you know, non-invasive ventilation. But it's always welcome in oral medicine because that ex reduces the exposure of the nurses and doctors to the yeah. patients. You don't have to give an injection. That's right. Yeah. Uh, Hello, sir. I am Dr. Mavana Zaman. Sure. Yeah. So I have you? got one. Yeah, I have got one question to you. Yes. So okay, can I uh, the the DAPA uh, heart failure uh, uh, that uh, shows that uh, it can be used more both in diabetic and non-diabetic patient. Yes. But uh, at least fifty-five percent patient was uh, non-diabetic. No, no. Fifty-two percent patients were non-diabetics. Yeah, that's it. Forty-eight were diabetics. That means that it can be safe to be given in both diabetic and non-diabetic patient. Yes, but it we is are, safe. We are a little bit scared about uh, the use of anti-diabetic patient in heart failure patient because it initially it was started as anti-diabetic. Yes. But if we give to a heart failure patient without having diabetes, so there is a common. Um, uh, about the patient and patient attendance and also some physician that by mistake maybe this drug has been given to him. He is not diabetic. Is it a problem in your clinical practice? No, I think it's a matter of counseling. It's a matter of counseling because anything new which comes and uh, you know it will be surprising 
that how come this thing but when empagliflazon came yeah now i think 6 years ago it was anti diabetic drug and suddenly it showed that it's improving the outcomes and uh, it's excreting sugar through urine and all of us were being taught to check <laughs> urine by heuristics and now any patient on sglt2 blocker will be throwing sugar so these are concepts Yeah. Have so, with same, yeah. same, same with uh, uh, yes. your uh, Tadalafil or or these yes. are the drug commonly yes. given yes. for some purpose, but yes. it helps to improve the patient with heart failure. Absolutely. So initially there was a and, and yes, some yes. taboo not to use this thing. Uh, right. yes. These are some things. Things. Come come to the we have to teach. I think we have to have uh, CMEs with general practitioners. We have to you know teach the doctors first because it is an individual doctor who will convince the person. But yeah. definitely, it will not produce any hypotensive. Uh, oh, sorry, hypoglycemic. One has event. to be little careful because many of the heart failure patients are on high dose of diuretics. So yeah. we should try and reduce the dose of diuretics. Yeah, there is a diuretic that can produce hypovolemia. And what's the dose that can be given safely? Hypoglycemia. You know, yes. What about the chances of hypoglycemia? Hypoglycemia, as was seen in this study, uh, was not. Yeah, not, not sure. It was a supervised study. And at best, the HbA1c reduction with the SGLT2 is 0.87, so it should not produce hypoglycemia. The dosage which is recommended, which was used in this, was 10 milligrams. It yeah. is available as 5 and 10, but in a borderline patient with pressures around 100, which very often patients have, you start with 5, look for a few days, and then go to 10. And in our country, I think we are, we have got two strengths. And then 25. What is 10, 10 and, and 25? Or the ten and twenty-five. Then ten is the dose. Ten is the dose. Empagliflozin is ten and twenty-five, but empagliflozin has still not the emperor trial. We still have to wait. I'm sure. Hopefully, it should be positive. But till that time, I think uh, we should be using dapagliflozin because it is the only drug which has been shown. And we know evidence-based medicine is evidence-based medicine. Uh, we'll be very happy if empagliflozin is positive. Because then we know it is the same. But let me tell you that all SGLT2 inhibitors are not not the same. Now yeah. a new one which has come, uh, ertuglutide, which was released only about ten days back, and it came in the you know American ADA conference. It showed that yes, it also reduced heart heart failure incidence, and it had the patient population was exactly the same as for Emparec. 100 percent patients with cardiovascular disease, and it did not show even one percent reduction in MACE. So the commonality ended at reducing the heart failure, but the other benefits were not being seen. So we have to study because we are not going to find head-to-head -head trials between two. Empa is not going to have a trial with Depa. Depa is not going to have a trial with Kena because uh, commercial interest and also very large number of patients required for you know similar molecule drugs. So, if there is no other question, then uh, uh, I, are there any question? Yes. Yes. Please go ahead. Can't hear you. Unmute yourself. Unmute. So, sir, Atari, yes. sir, we can ask you a question. Yes. Atari, unmute. Yes. Now, yes. can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, sir. Sir, I just asked a question, sir. Sir. Is there any evidence that we can combine ARNI and SGL2 together when the heart failure management? Is there any that, that is yeah. ARNI? The, yeah, very well, uh, very good question. But in the DAPA heart failure study, 11 percent patients were on ARNI. Yeah, 11 percent. AS inhibitor, ARNI, and ARBS combined were 92 percent. But if you look at ARNI alone, because they're still not being prescribed so often as AS inhibitors. But they were 11 percent, and the benefit was same whether the patient was an ARNI, ARB, or ACE inhibitor. So you can. Thank you, sir. So if if no more question is there, then I, on behalf of the Department of Cardiology, I express my heartfelt thanks to eminent cardiologists, real teacher and researcher, Professor Upendra Paul. I know him since 1998. when i visited his center as a trainee in interventional cardiology so 
once again his his presence glorified our program there is no shadow of doubt and he is a very known figure in bangladesh so from the core of my heart i express my thankful gratitude to you sir thank you very much thank you sir Thank, thank you. you very much, and uh, may Allah bless all of you. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank sir. You, Professor. Thank you, sir. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we, we are going through COVID pandemic. In fact, the COVID-19 has got more mortality and morbidity among the heart failure patients. Not only that, this SARS-CoV-2 virus is creating different cardiovascular conditions, which are also creating heart failure. Uh, so... Dr. Risham Barua, who is the consultant cardiologist, Chelsea and Westminster Hospital, Imperial College London. She is the technical director, NICE guideline for heart failure management. She will be talking on management of heart failure in COVID-19. May I request Dr. Risham Barua to deliver her speech. Hello. Thank you all for having me. Can I just check that you can hear me? Yes. Yes, ma'am. You are clear. Okay. And hopefully you'll be able to see my slides in a moment. So I tried to put together um, a, a presentation that I hope would be pertinent to what we are all going through at the moment um, and was triggered by numerous conversations that we've been having with our um, friends and colleagues in Bangladesh. Um, and which uh, Dr. Monjour has been facilitating. So again, thank you very much for um, inviting me to speak and um, it's a great privilege and pleasure um, to be able to take part in this webinar. You're and- welcome, uh, Yes, yes ma'am, go on, please. Great, so uh, what I hope to talk to you today is a little bit about risk, um, the risk of heart failure, um, but also uh, the risk of COVID and, uh, and the risk that we now face a new situation where we are, um, uh, where our patients now pose a risk to us um, and, uh, the pa and we pose a risk to our patients. So um, perhaps in trying to manage their heart failure, we may um, expose them to COVID or they may expose us to COVID. So um, this is hopefully just a talk thinking about some of the processes that we should um, think about uh, and, and how we can safely diagnose people with heart failure and how we can um, best treat and manage our patients and particularly those patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction because as we've already heard today that's where most of the evidence lies. So I do not need to tell um, this esteemed audience about how heart failure is the most malignant disease in cardiology. If you were to be admitted to an NHS hospital with an ST elevation MI in the UK, then your one year mortality is approximately 20, it's approximately 7%. If we contrast that with a heart failure admission to a UK hospital, the one year mortality is actually closer to 28% or 30%. And so um, we really are dealing with an incredibly malignant disease here. And that is true internationally, but that is true in the United States. And whilst these data are old, I think they still hold true. Uh, Ma'am, can you share your screen? Oh, I'm sorry. Screen. I'm sorry, I thought I was. I do apologize. It's okay. Uh, Are you able to see now? Yes, uh, you have to go for slideshow. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's fine. Now it's go visible. Yes. Back. You it, can it's see okay. now. Yes. So, apologies. So, um, uh, as I was saying, and as you are all well aware, the most malignant disease in, in cardiology and one of the most malignant diseases in medicine. 
And uh, these are the UK data. It is common. The prevalence is increasing as the incidence increases. And for, um, for, for any healthcare system, the impact is huge, particularly in terms of budget. So it is the most um, expensive condition that we treat in the UK to um, the NHS. And that is in part because it costs so many bed days. So it's the hospitalizations that cost the money. And uh, this is not just true of the UK. So cardiovascular disease is the now the most common problem in Bangladesh um, and is increasing in incidence. And all of this, these slides that I've shown you are slides that I've shown at presentations for many years um, and has held true for a long time. Um, but now we're faced with a slightly different problem, which is the COVID issue. But what were we doing pre-COVID? So in the UK, um, we have a very formalized, standardized way of making the diagnosis of heart failure. And this is based on the NICE guidance. So NICE is our national institution for um, clinical excellence. And they look at both the efficacy of tests and medications and interventions, but also the cost effectiveness because everything has a resource implication. And so uh, the NICE guidance, uh, which uh, looked at chronic heart failure in 2018, really used naturetic peptides as the gateway to diagnosis for um, heart failure. And the reason why it became cost effective in the UK to use naturetic peptides was as a gatekeeper because for us, the, the cost of a naturetic peptide is around it's between about 20 and 35 pounds, which is quite expensive for a test. Um, however, it cuts down significantly on the number of people that need echocardiography. And in the UK, we are limited by the number of people we have that can perform the echocardiography. So our resources um, are limited by the number of stenographers that we have. And actually, when you plow through the data about the use of NT Pro BMP. It was actually the identification of those patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction that made it a worthwhile pursuit. So the reason why we are in the first place is to identify that cohort with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction because they are the cohort for whom we can change prognosis. So the NICE guidelines say you should do NT pro BMP. And if that is raised, you should do echocardiography. And depending on how raised it is, that will determine how quickly you should do echocardiography because we are looking to identify those patients either with reversible causes in the form of valvular disease or uh, those patients with heart failure reduced ejection fraction. And uh, the NICE guidance is very clear about uh, what treatments, what disease modifying agents we should be using um, for our heart failure patients. So if I talk you through the algorithm for those with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction, there were no prognostic medications that were determined to be efficacious. And therefore, what the NICE guidance says is to treat the comorbid conditions such as the diabetes, such as the hypertension, and to look at exercise programs. But all the drug therapy is on this side of the algorithm for the heart failure with reduced ejection fraction patients. And for the NICE guidance, they're really talking about an ejection fraction of less than 40% because that incorporates most of the trial data. And um, first line for all these patients with heart failure reduced ejection fraction were according to NICE, are ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, and MRA if symptomatic, so spironolactone or plerinone. And then for NICE, the position for ARNI, which we've heard about, is down here, which is if you have been stable on an ACE or an ARB for a month or longer and um, continue to have symptoms and have an ejection fraction of less than 35% in the UK, you then qualify for an ARNI. And the other specialist treatments include um, evabridine, nitrates and hydralazine, digoxin and device therapy. 
And we know that in this most malignant of diseases, if you take the combination of ACE inhibitor, beta blocker and MRA, particularly at optimal dose, there is the potential to triple life expectancy. So we take the most malignant disease in cardiology and we have the ability with simple available drugs to triple life expectancy. And we've heard a lot about our knees already today and the paradigm study. And to say that um, paradigm as well as DAPA HF did have some patients from Asia. So they were Indian patients, but there was representation from Asian pa patients. And when we do a network meta-analysis of our heart failure with reduced ejection fraction medications, we see that the optimal combination of medications. So if you or I unfortunately were to develop um, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, what is it we would want? Well, we'd want an ARNI rather than an ACE or an ARB, a beta blocker and an MRA. And we can have a profound effect on both mortality and hospitalization. And following on from the last talk, I now think that we are entering the era of no longer talking about triple therapy in heart failure, but rather quadruple therapy. And as a heart failure physician who knows very little about diabetes, for me, SGLT2 inhibitors are heart failure medications first and foremost. Unfortunately, in the UK, I cannot prescribe them to patients who do not have diabetes, but I believe the evidence is there from DAPR HF for the use of the SGLT2s in patients who do not have diabetes. So the inclusion criteria for DAPR HF, as we just heard, uh, was symptomatic heart failure. This was a heart failure trial, not a diabetes trial like the Empereg trial. And um, of note, the exclusion criteria was an EGFR of less than 30. Um, in the UK, we cannot give um, uh, SGLT2s for uh, EGFR less than 60, but DAPR HF demonstrated that it is safe to give in patients with EGFR down to uh, or, or above 30. So um, we've just far more eloquent. I can describe all about the DAPR HF trials, carry on. Um, and uh, in my experience, these are well tolerated medications. Patients like them because of the weight loss, though often the weight loss is not profound. Um, but there are issues with um, urinary tract infections, particularly in real life, and patients do need to be warned about that. But what's very key, I think, um, in particularly in the COVID era, is this volume status issue. So um, in the UK, we have this terminology around patient education called sick day rules. And um, we would say that patients who have any sort of diarrheal illness or illness that could lead to hypovolemia, including fever, which is a key point in COVID, should hold their ACE inhibitor, their ARB, their ARNI, potentially their diuretics, their SGLT2 inhibitors until that illness has resolved. And that's a really key message that needs to come out because the cases of euglycemic uh, um, ketoacidosis that we've seen in um, our centers have been related to patients continuing to take their SGLT2s when they've had concomitant other illnesses. Okay, so how does all this sit, which, you know, we're all very familiar with the, the evidence base for, um, for the heart failure with reduced ejection fraction um, disease modifying agents, how does that sit in COVID-19? And what are we doing differently and how are we going to manage our patients? So um, this is, uh, these are the data about the mortality of, uh, from COVID-19 in the UK. And here we have the Bangladeshi curve. And I find it very interesting that you have a population double the size of ours, but um, your number of recorded deaths is at the moment far fewer, though 
I'm um, feeling less optimistic when I look at the shape of your curve, but perhaps you will tell me more about that later. And um, those deaths in the UK are excess mortality. So these are not deaths that we would expect to occur anyway. There has been a substantial excess mortality, unfortunately, from COVID-19. And it has changed the way that we have practiced and it is changing the way that we are managing our heart failure patients because we have to be pragmatic. Our resources at the moment are far more limited um, and, and we have... Um, we have to act um, in a way that is safe and responsible to our patients and our team. So fundamentally, I showed you what NICE says we should be doing under normal circumstances. Under normal circumstances, patients would normally present to their primary care physician with symptoms of breathlessness, fatigue, swelling, and their GP should be sending them for a BNP test. And if that is raised, then they should be getting an echocardiogram in a timely fashion. So in terms of those echocardiograms and providing that, that happens at our center, at our hospital, and we need to decide, is it appropriate and necessary to do that echo scan? So where we have a BNP, particularly if it's markedly raised, that may push us towards um, doing an echo scan. If we have a BNP that is marginal, then we may think that actually we can go without an echo scan for that patient. So what we really need to decipher is what is the clinical need for that patient to get that echo scan and what is the risk to the patient and what is the risk to us? And this is going to be on a patient by patient basis. We need to consider how vulnerable the patient is um, to, to both spreading the disease, but also contracting the disease, how likely they are to have heart failure. So this is very much Bayesian principles of pretest probability. What resources do we have available? And are we, are we likely to get heart failure with reduced ejection fraction where we know we can make a difference? So the risk factors for COVID, as I'm sure we are all aware, this people who's, who the elderly do worse if they contract COVID. And the UK is a disease for the elderly. Our mean age of presentation is 78. Patients who have known cardiovascular disease are more, are more susceptible or certainly more susceptible to a worse problem to a worse outcome with COVID. And obviously, if someone has had ischemic heart disease, they are more likely to develop heart failure. Diabetes, again, this is a risk factor for both diseases, both for COVID and for heart failure. Chronic respiratory disease in the UK, there is a big overlap between populations who have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and those who have heart failure. Hypertension has been the big story of COVID. Patients with hypertension um, and, and obesity, I should say as well, have, have been very prone to COVID and to worse outcomes. And this may be to do with the ACE2 receptor, but obviously heart failure is a risk factor for both HEF-REF and HEF-PEF. So here we see that the, the cumulative incidence of heart failure increases as people are more hypertensive. Sorry, I should say the yellow and the blue graphs are for COVID, the red and the, and the, and the blood pressure graph are for heart failure. Cancer is a risk factor for COVID, but obviously age is related to cancer risk. Obesity is a risk factor for COVID. And here we go, obesity is a risk factor for heart failure. So we're looking at very closely aligned populations and, you know, people who are overloaded with heart failure will also have a cough. So some of the symptoms also align. And uh, we talked about gender today. The male gender is much more of a risk factor for um, uh, COVID 
uh, and a worse outcome with COVID. And uh, as we've already seen, we see, seem to see more heart failure patients with the, who are male, um, but that may be due to inherent biases. So we need to screen our patients before we bring them in for these echo scans. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't be diagnosing the heart failure. I'm saying the opposite because, of course, I've shown you this is a high mortality condition, which we can do something about. But we need to make sure that we are not bringing patients who have symptoms of COVID into our department or, hasn't, or patients who've been in contact with someone with symptoms. And we need to decide, is this a diagnosis worth doing? Are we going to be able to manage the heart failure? And in many healthcare um, conditions, in many places, that will depend on the patient themselves. Um, are they going to take the ARNI? Are they going to take the beta blocker? Are they going to get a device? How are they going to get to the hospital? And in terms of patients who are established on medications and who need up titrations, how many times are we going to keep bringing them back for monitoring um, and to up titrate them? Uh, and, and I think it's often worth being explicit with patients and asking them explicitly um, whether they are currently being tested or anyone has considered that they may have COVID. If the decision is to go ahead with the echo scan, we need to um, do so in the safest way possible. So we need to look at the flows through our departments. Are we using separate entrances and exits for people? How do we minimize the amount of contact people are having within the hospital? How much spread we're getting within the hospital? So we're putting masks on every single person that enters the hospital. In the UK, we're not allowing relatives in. It's just the patient themselves. And we need to just double check that they have not had any symptoms that could be COVID when they do arrive. And we're doing temperature checks and we're also doing the, the, the COVID tests on people. Our staff are extremely anxious at the moment. I know in Bangladesh, you've had a lot of deaths of healthcare workers, and this is absolutely tragic so we have a responsibility to protect ourselves and our teams because um, that is how we are going to get the best outcomes for our patients so at the very least when doing an echo scan we're saying that you should have eye protection the fluid resistance mask an apron and gloves but actually ideally you have the full visor and the surgical gown and two pairs of gloves because for anyone who has performed echo, you can be sat there next to the patient breathing in the air that they're exhaling for a good 20, 30 minutes. So that was a little bit of a romp through about um, what we're doing. In terms of the medications, we know that our knees are safe in acute heart failure. The experience with our needs is that they can cause quite a lot of volume depletion, but they're profound. They, they do lead to a fall in blood pressure. So in my experience, the patients who do best with our needs are those who are NYHA class two. But it is safe to start it in an acute setting. And if it were you or I who have heart failure, you would want an ARNI. So um, it's important to try and get people on the best medications as quickly as possible. As I've alluded to, because of COVID, we may try and reduce the number of steps of titration to optimal doses. So there is a balance here between um, optimizing and being pragmatic and not bringing back people too much um, because every time we make a step change in um, medications, we need to um, recheck renal function and what we tr we're trying to do is minimize contacts to the absolute necessary. So we need to um, think about the individual patient, what is their risk of heart failure and, and in particular what's their likelihood of having heart failure reduced ejection fraction. What risk is the patient posing to us, to the healthcare workers, to the team? Um, and 
in performing a diagnostic test and performing echocardiography, what we don't want to do is expose patients to a potentially life-threatening disease in the form of COVID. So I think on an institution by institution basis, we need to be thinking about how we most safely manage the patients with heart failure and the wider department and how we get them on the best medic medications as quickly as possible. But also for those patients who have symptoms of COVID, particularly if they have a prolonged fever, who are already on medications, we need to be very careful about telling them to hold those medications that can lead to hypovolemia. So I hope you could see all that and hear me and thank you very much for having me. I think um, at the time of COVID, it's all the more pertinent to go back to absolute first principles of doing the basics well and always to keep um, what Hippocrates said at heart, which is that we have a responsibility to first do no harm. Thank you, Dr. Prisham Barua. It was a brilliant talk. It was a time demanding talk. In fact, we are, our cardiologists are looking for these sort of suggestions regarding the management of heart failure in COVID and uh, pandemic area. Uh, we have got Professor Abdul Wadud Choudhury, sir, with us. He's a great clinical cardiologist and um, professor of cardiology and head of the department of Dhaka Medical College. Sir, uh, would you please tell us your experience regarding heart failure in COVID era in, among the COVID patients? Well, to tell you the truth, in this era of COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we are dealing patients in Dhaka Middle College, but only the inpatients, because the outpatients, they are uh, basically getting the initial diagnosis and being referred to other hospitals. Uh, all the non-COVID patients, they are not getting in there. And the patients with heart failure, those are being admitted. It, it creates a little bit of a problem because the shortness of breath they are suffering from is it due to heart failure or its exacerbation or due to the pneumonia itself. And sometimes we have to use the CT scan, anti preparatory we cannot do more often, but we can do the CT scan to have the idea of what we can do. Because I cannot check the patient properly to see whether the patient has uh, the, the base of the lungs. I cannot do that properly because of the chance of exposure. So we have to resort to the patient's uh, what he is feeling, he or she is feeling, what she is telling, what the ECG is saying, and what the investigation like a chest X-ray or ECG is telling us. And that creates a great difference. And we have to do, uh, do, take some comp do some compromise, keep oxygen as well, see the response. If he's not responding, then add a diuretic, taking care that the patient do not get uh, hypovolemic. And that, that, that one thing, because if you are making the patient hypovolemic, you are increasing the hematocrite, making hemoconcentration, the chance of thrombosis is much more. And that's the problem we are facing, and we are taking uh, all these points into consideration and taking a middle road of everything. Thank you, sir. Uh, may I request Professor M. Atar Ali, sir, to give his opinion? Professor Atar Ali, sir, is the leading electrophysiologist of our country. And he's being the uh, different devices like ICD and CRT in our country. Though the number is very low in our country, uh, it is hardly 150 to 200 devices per year when we have got more than 1 million heart failure patients. Sir, would you please tell us about your experience regarding these device therapies and how can we make it more available to our patients? So thank you, Dr. Firoz. And finally, I want to congratulate all the speaker, particularly not only Dr. Risham Borua. I will. Uh, I definitely am happy to congratulate you for a brilliant and nice and very informative lecture. But I must also mention the name of Professor Abdul Kadir Akhundo. Particularly, he has nicely described. I have never seen such a type of lecture on the right heart failure today. It is a great lecture I have seen today. That they, particularly I know about the heart failure, but particularly regarding the right heart failure, and also Abi Al Hussein. I had got question for Abhi Al Hussein, but still I want to ask uh, that is Resham Borua. That is uh, in our experience, I deal with, uh, still I work in a uh, tertiary care hospital. We have got the well-developed cardiovascular system. There are the 
not only it is the heart failure we have got many of the patient i don't know whether these are the coincidence or this is the real etiological correlation we don't know we have got some of of the patient that is that presented with the complete heart block this patient has got the covid positive i don't know which is, which one is the first complete heart block we have got some of the acute coronary syndrome the patient underwent the angiogram covid positive coronary is a normal there are some reports that the patient got the sudden cardiac death and the patient was the covid positive so there are the varieties of presentation in also we have got some of the my colleague is a pediatric cardiologist she she told that she has got some patient she has the, the, that is a, a coronary vasculitis like the kawasaki's disease so this is the diverse presentation diverse presentations of the uh, covid patients but what we learned from you particularly regarding the heart failure in the covid era that is outstanding and definitely that increased my knowledge particularly for regarding of this patient but we have seen that is these are the and particularly what uh, dr firoz has told not relating to the covid as the whole heart failure there is a huge number of the patient the bangladeshi population is nearly one that is 50% of the us population the percentage of the population that is 30 crore in us 16 crore in bangladesh 50% but the number of the device utilization is just less than 1% of the what is used in the united states so this is the difference that is rate of utilization of the uh, device therapy particularly there are many limitation and the patient does not get access to the, there are there are many of the patient but they does not get access to this kind of the therapy so this is not the forum to discuss all the issues today but i want to congratulate you for your fine discussion about the uh, heart failure and if you want you can comment is there any correlation can you explain any pathophysiological mechanism that is the coronary that is the acute conduction system disorder in case of the covid dr burwa um yeah so we have seen it as well and in particular we've seen it on the intensive care unit so people who seem to have extremely severe covid um requiring intubation and ventilation do seem to get bradycardias arrhythmias um and complete heart block that seems to be direct, um sort of i think at the beginning of this process we were expecting to see um uh more um uh myocarditis covid myocarditis than we've seen what i think is happening is that we're getting a sort of stress cardiomyopathy um and and the effects of this catecholamine response but like you we're seeing everything we're seeing thrombosis everywhere including in the coronary arteries we're seeing um uh i think uh inflammation within the heart but not on on what my colleagues in in northern italy are saying is that when they do the post mortem they're not finding the viral pcr within the myocardium um so it's a very odd picture but we are seeing this complete heart block and actually i think by the time patients are getting the arrhythmias the prognosis is really very poor can I, can i add something regarding that welcome i i had to do a, a pacemaker implant yesterday that's a covid patient uh, he was doing well he had some pericardia some bundle branch block doing well and preparing for uh, get, going home then he suddenly developed severe pericardia heart rate around 20 has to be put on the emergency tap replacement maker waited for more than 2 weeks whether they she, he can re, he revert or not he doesn't the rate remains very low around 25 heart beats per minute when they roll out the uh, tpm day so i have to put uh, the pacemaker yesterday and uh, this is very ter- ter- terrible some of the patient we are seeing before they are getting very worse they develop pericardia and then they suddenly develop a very severe uh symptoms and apparently they are were getting well from the pneumonia side and then they are getting very bad again and that's the point whenever they are getting bradycardia like i tell my uh, doctors be aware this patient is going to crash if you are not taking care be more aggressive thank, in that thank you sir thank you abdul uh, dr abdul wadu chaudhary uh, may i request dr nm mominu jaman sir to say a few words about Mamun Jaman Star is the leading international cardiologist of Bangladesh, and uh, uh, he's working in United Hospital. He's also conducting a heart failure clinic. 
in united hospital no, sir no, thank uh, you thank you sir would you please yeah, tell us about your experience in heart failure clinic it's a wonderful program organized by uh, salimullah medical college especially uh, uh, abdul uh, abdul kader akhand and also a, a very nice deliberation on this uh, specifically heart failure in the era of covid 19 by three uh, international faculties uh, uh, professor bundar kaul uh, professor abiel husaini and resham barua excellent excellent especially uh, i have said the, the many things actually we underestimate the situation uh, of heart failure in and all over the world not only in bangladesh uh, especially right heart failure the way doctor um, uh all the kadar uh, given uh, really it's a uh, opening of eyes to a most neglected part of heart failure is the right heart failure uh, actually we commonly feel that is a secondary to left heart failure commonly we are practicing right heart failure like this but there are so many way that can be uh, uh, causing this heart failure after uh, uh, just uh, listening the lecture by uh, dr akhan that is really impressive and uh, yeah professor pandragul as usual uh, his lecture was excellent because this is a new dimension in the treatment of heart failure probably it will come in the next uh, guideline two more drug will come one is hgl2t uh, 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 and other one is the, um uh, that is uh, uh, we call it uh, brutal cyclase stimulator that is got very see that uh, when the new drug is coming that will help to improve the treatment of heart failure in in general uh, you know all the heart disease patient end up with heart failure so <coughs> it's uh, something like uh, no way whatever we are treating the patient by angioplasty or by uh, bypass surgery uh, because of the aging process the number of heart failure patient is increasing day by day and it is most un- underestimated the uh, problem in the society including the western country uh, we are talking about cancer and man- many many deadly disease but none of them are really supersede the, the heart failure it is more than 48% patient uh, five years mortality it's a huge number so i think it's a time to to mitigate this problem uh, moreover the asian burden is extra burden because of their younger age there are more mortality and less amount of the excellent medication are uh, under utilized like arni aldosterone antagonist so these are the issues should be targeted to to tackle the heart failure to me i think it is not the single man uh, show it's a integrated program in a more organized form not that the chamber is a more, more organized form comprises a cardiologist a specialist especially on clinical cardiology a dedicated nurse a counselor then a psychiatrist so all this can handle this neglected group of patient because once the patient a heart failure patient in a family really he is a a neglected one because he always depend on somebody he cannot go to the hospital alone he needs somebody especially more neglected than male so these are the issues needs to be addressed specifically in my hospital i am running the um, uh, the clinic uh, heart failure clinic for last 2 years and there is a unique database uh, uh, heart clinic uh, medronic uh, has helped us to provide me a software uh, we call it smiling heart is a unique part is this nowadays uh, we have seen the difference between the treatment what we are giving now and the treatment given earlier every day morning my counselor once he open up the uh, laptop or the uh, computer he will find a number of patient contact number waiting to be just make a phone call it is a it is a computer generated software generated number of patient needs to be uh, contact over phone every day 
depend on his previous clinical situation. Like uh, if the patient has class three, he will be informed early, say a week or two. So this way, we have seen an excellent outcome in a sense, the number of hospital admission and number of serious acute decompensation or previously compensated is number has reduced because every day, at least once in a week, the serious patient will be get a phone call from my counselor. How are you? What is your body weight? Are you taking the medicine regularly? So these are certain things actually he's been asked. So they are constantly attached with the medication. There is the one way it reduces the number of rehospitalization. I think not the prescription uh, will help them to treat this patient. It needs integrated approach and it, it doesn't need any special, super special cardiologist. Simple a case manager, we call the case manager. She is enough, especially these are paramedics. I recruit a, a paramedics to handle this patient. I don't recruit a, a, a postgraduate doctor, a paramedics who is authorized to write even prescription. He will just make a phone call. How are you? What is your body weight? Are you taking the drug? Is there any side effect? So either way, and the patient also give you a phone call. Today I'm getting more weight. Okay, increase the diuretics. Okay, I'm not getting, uh, my pressure is low. Okay, they reduce the dose of uh, AC inhibitor or ARB or ARNI. So these way they can titrate the medicine, keeping them at home. So I think everybody should think in a way to support this neglected group of uh, what um, Resham says, the malignant uh, cardiovascular disease in an integrated uh, approach to at least improve the little bit quality of life. That is a few things I can I can say. Thank you very much once again uh, for, you, uh, for, for this wonderful uh, program. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, may I request Professor Shajal Krishna Banerjee, sir, to say a few words regarding this. He is also the Dean of Medicine Faculty, uh, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Medical University. Professor Shajal Banerjee. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Firoz. First of all, I must uh, give thanks to Professor uh, Abdul Kadir Rakon for arranging such a such an exceptional uh, symposium or uh, event here on behalf of uh, Sir Salimullah Medical College and Mitford Hospital. Uh, then I have seen uh, uh, two uh, foreign delegates or foreign speakers, uh, Dr. Abhi Al Husseini and uh, Dr. Rishma uh, Barua. Both of them are very well known to me and virtually they are the uh, family member of my university. I must congratulate them and I must wish them that uh, they have presented very nicely and we are really charmed with their presentation. Uh, thank you very much and I must congratulate you again. Uh, then uh, Dr. Dr. Professor Abdul the account. He only given a light, uh, though later, uh, about the uh, right heart failure, which was a really a neglected chapter uh, before. And we are always uh, busy with the left ventricular failure or left heart failure. But uh, today, he has given many, many uh, uh, ideas and clues regarding the uh, uh, etiology and the management of right heart failure. I must congratulate again uh, Professor Abdul Khadir Akhan and uh, not last but or least uh, Professor Upendra Kaul. He, he has given a nice lecture and uh, virtually we are really crazy of a, a new drug for heart failure uh, every day and uh, today uh, we have uh, got the news that DAPA, uh, DAPA is a uh, new heart, a new drug for heart failure, I, even without diabetes. So uh, many, many thanks to uh, Professor Upendra Kaul. Uh, and again, I want to express my uh, thanks and gratitude to all the speakers for their nice deliberation. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, may we listen to Dr. Shuk Nayar. He is the president of Royal Society of Medicine, Cardio Cardiology Section and the communication lead. British Cardiovascular Society. Uh, Dr. Shuk, uh, 
can you tell us something about the pharmacological latest pharmacological treatment of heart failure and your experience in the um, covid pandemic thank you very much thank you for having me on this uh, wonderful webinar and it's so incredibly well delivered great to hear really clear and passionate talks from all of the speakers today i work very closely with uh, dr reshin burrow and ali dr uh, abi al husseini um, and so i i know them very well it's uh, great to see them on here and building the links with Bangladesh. Um, inter I'm an interventional cardiologist and just a few comments on um, kind of things that we've seen recently. We've certainly seen a big increase in heart failure related events in the COVID era and we've also seen a number of inc um, patients needing pacemakers quite urgently. One of the other panelists was commenting on patients suddenly decompensating with COVID uh, eye implant pacemakers. And certainly over the last few months, I've had to do a, a huge number in patients who've had COVID-19. Um, this is, uh, I think, an important factor that's unrecognized. There's also sudden arrhythmogenic death that can occur uh, unexpectedly in patients with COVID-19. We don't fully understand this. It happens also in young people. We've had a couple of cases of patients going home and then having uh, an arrhythmic event. To answer your particular question about the pharma, uh, the new uh, pharmacology in heart failure, I think much of it's been discussed already, but the, the key new developments are the, um, the addition of the SGLT2 drugs. These, these drugs um, at the moment, dipiglifosin, are absolutely key, and we will start to use these in routine practice, I'm absolutely sure. As Rosham has already said, there are licensing restrictions here in the United Kingdom about their use in non-diabetic patients. However, we are uh, beginning new studies uh, to use them in patients without diabetes, much like DAPA. Uh, and we're also beginning to look at studies that will use it in post myocardial infarction patients. Um, so again, extending their use. These uh, appear to have big benefit. You can see the curves diverge very early, implying that they have a benefit that's over and above a uh, simple diuretic effect. There seems to be something very special about these medications. The curves continue to separate over a long period of time, implying that the benefit continues to accumulate. And so it will fall on us as cardiologists to identify the patients who can take these drugs, start them, and then educate them on their use. I think, uh, as Resham has pointed out earlier, sick day rules are very, very important. This is something that has uh, caused uh, patients to have complications. Um, and in our hospital, um, we've now developed a protocol to uh, explain when patients should discontinue these drugs. Um, I, for example, before uh, performing an operation, and a surgery, or even a procedure like an angiogram when patients are nil by mouth, and then also when they are unwell for other reasons. The other component is we must educate our emergency care doctors, those in accident emergency, must remember if they see patients on an SGLT2 inhibitor, then they should check the ketones because euglycemic um, uh, diabetic ketoacidosis uh, can occur in these particular patients. But this is an exciting time. I suspect we will see huge benefits uh, in patients with the addition of these drugs over and above what's already used in heart failure. Thank you, Dr. Shuk. Uh, may I request Professor Abdullah Shafi Mujinda sir to say a few words for us? Professor Abdullah Shafi Mujinda sir, sir, are you with us? Sorry, probably he's not with us. Uh, may I request Professor M. Nuzrul Islam sir to say a few words regarding these topics? Professor Nuzrul Islam, sir. Sir, sir, left the program for any okay. urgent business. So, okay, sir. Uh, we, we, have, we have seen, Jalaluddin. we have got Professor M. Muhammad Jalaluddin, sir, one of the, our senior cardiologists. Uh, sir, would you please tell a few words for us regarding this? Are you hearing me? Yes, sir. We can hear you, sir. I thank uh, Professor uh, Abdul Qadir Akon and Dr. Piroz to arrange this program, this multinational uh, program in Harfield. Uh, I, thank, I thank Dr. Mohani Joman to start with uh, the cardiac failure center in his, in his hospital. Uh, one thing I state that there should be one cardiac rehabilitation center in everywhere, where there is a heart failure center. 
because at discharge from hospital, the patient should have a data of his condition, say about the ECG, or is the condition of the ECG, echocardiography, because at discharge, the ejection patient may be something, but on follow-up, his condition may worsen, and later it has to be seen periodically, the ejection patient, whether how it is, uh, is it like before, or it has decreased. And another one is, is exercise capacity should be seen on treadmill, uh, that what is his capacity of uh, stress, taking the stress, because after going home, he may be in some office professional work, or uh, if it's very severe, he may remain at home, but his exercise capacity should be seen because uh, the whether how much exercise he can take, and uh, that can be assessed for the uh, uh, condition of the heart failure, severity of the heart failure, and also whether he develops any arrhythmia, malignant arrhythmia, to, uh, uh, because the heart failure patient may die of uh, ventricular uh, tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation when the ejection fraction is very low. So in the, this patient, it can be uh, diagnosed that these patients are having arrhythmia uh, with stress test. Then uh, device treatment may be given. And so I, uh, uh, my uh, advice that whenever there is any heart failure center, there should be a rehabilitation center also. Thank you very much. I thank Dr. Abdul Kader once again. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Heroes, up, uh, please unmute your. Please unmute yourself. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have got Dr. Munjur Shaukat with us, uh, who is also a student of Sarsalimula Medical College, now working in Hammersmith Hospital, UK. Uh, Dr. Munjur, um, uh, say a few words for us. You have seen heart failure management in Bangladesh and UK. What so, are the points? Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me on this panel. And um, it's a great success for Professor uh, Abdul Kader. Actually, and also thanking my friends and colleagues at Imperial. They all did a fantastic job. And this is kind of kind of collaboration between these two countries. Uh, I do not have actually uh, time to say many things. I have to actually leave in a minute. I've got another commitment. What I would say that from Professor Akin's talk, uh, he mentioned about the pharmacological treatment or exercise. Uh, what I will tell people, all the doctors in Bangladesh, and like a heart failure patient, they are a fragile patient. Please, please do encourage them to do some kind of exercise when they are at home, because a lot of them are very stressed not going out because of lockdown. It would be good, whatever they can do at home, uh, uh, it doesn't matter how much they could do, but if they can keep themselves active, that will actually generate their immune system to produce more macrophages. This is one of the immune system for our own body. And I would thank Abby to become women's voice during her talk. It was a fantastic talk. Professor Upendra Paul's talk is an amazing talk. And, and Risham talks. well, I'm a big fan of Risham. And actually, I have invited her to talk on this webinar. And finally, uh, Bangladesh has got a new friend, Dr. Sukhnia. Uh, I think probably Suk has uh, sent a message across. And you on this webinar, Bangladesh is good news for Bangladesh. You've got a new friend. And finally, it is, it is a good time to think about Bangladesh cardiologists to develop Bangladeshi guidelines for heart failure. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Manjur. Thank you very much. Dr. Uh, Dr. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, only a few seconds. Dr. Yes, Manjur Shaukat. Sure, Manjur Shaukat is my student. And he is working as a bridge between Bangladesh and UK. I must congratulate and give thanks to 
Dr. Manjur Shaukat. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I'm very proud to be you, student. Thank you. Bye to everyone. Thanks, Professor Ali Akhundan, everyone. And thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We are already late. Uh, if you have got any comment, uh, 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 may I request? Can I make a comment? Sure. Sure, sir. Uh, I just want to say, uh, Professor Kadir Akhundan, sir, has done a wonderful job. I didn't mention anything about that, but the subject is chosen, the three different aspects of heart failure treatment. These are not the usual talk we are having during heart failure webinars. So three or four new viewpoints, different ways, presented beautifully, and we are really lucky to have him organize such a beautiful uh, symposium. Thank you, sir, and thank you, your team. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for inspiring us. Uh, we have got uh, Professor Babu with us. Probably. Oh, left. Professor Mahur Rawan Babu. And thank you, Firoz. Actually, uh, I heard all the listeners, they are renowned, uh, all the presenters, they are renowned in all over the world. Among nice. Uh, I would like to thank for their nice, excellent, and time-worthy presentation. All the listeners should be benefited from their lectures, especially the fellows. I also congratulate Cardiology Department of Midford Hospital, especially Professor Abdul Kader Akhan, sir, and Amiru Jaman Khan Lablu, and all other doctors. And thank you all. Thank you, Piras. Thank you. Uh, now, may I request Professor Abdul Kadir Akhan sir, to conclude the session? So now I'm taking the opportunity to thanks the thanks all those participated in the program. Today's presentation and discussion revealed a lot about heart failure. But truly, we see the tip of the iceberg. Unveiling major hidden part of the heart failure is a challenge and probably it will remain for the future generation. I strongly believe the symposium organized by the Department of Cardiology, Sir Solimullah Medical College will benefit most of us and demands the periodic arrangement to continue the updating of our knowledge in the management of not only heart failure in other fields as well. My heartfelt thanks and gratitude to Dr. Abby Al Husseini. Probably she left the program. She is a nice guy. Always she is, she is with us. She is our old friend and she is so cooperative. Whenever we invite her, she participates in any program. Basically, she is an interventional cardiologist, but sometimes she, she works in BBC News regarding the presentation of cardiovascular disease in women. So his, her presentation goes to that part as well. And Dr. Reshom Borua is our new friend. She is the consultant cardiologist and the director of the NICE guideline for the heart failure management in UK. She is our, I hope she will continue the friendship with us and we will get the cooperation in future as well. I will keep, I will try to keep touch with you. Thank you again. Thank you from the core of my heart to take travel to make the program a success. And lastly, I want to request Dr. Reshom Borua to consider the right heart failure in the next upcoming guideline, nice guideline, heart failure guideline. And our another guest and panel of expert, Dr. Shuk, he's, he's a very nice guy. I heard a lot about him and his talk and discussion in, as a panel of expert gives us more inspiration. And in future, I will try to keep him as a speaker in next program. And he is a very giant man. He is the director, Royal Society of Medicine, cardiology section. 
So I express my thankful gratitude to him. And Dr. Munju Shaukot, the son of the soil, we have got the right to claim him to do something for the nation. So even then, I want to thank him. Professor Nuzrul Islam, Professor Abdullah Shafi Muzumda, Professor Shazol Banerjee, Professor Muminud Jaman, Professor Atahar Ali, Professor Mir Zamaluddin was supposed to present, but because of sickness, he is unable to attend the program. Professor Abdul Wadud Choudhury and Professor Fazila Tunnesa could not attend because she had another program to do. All are the high-profile cardiologists in Bangladesh. Their name is so famous that they does not need any introduction. So I thank everyone for kind cooperation. Lastly, I definitely I have to thank our doctors of the department because they work the inhuman from a success. And last but not the least, I thank the Incepta Pharmaceuticals, especially Dr. Riyadh and Mr. Afsar and his team for technical support. So I thank everyone for participating in the program to make it a success. And your encouragement will encourage us to make the program again and again. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you.